All right. Let's read about Jim Carrey and why he was able to manifest the life that he now has. Jim Carrey's $10 million check is one of the most famous examples of manifesting in popular culture, but how it came to be is less well known. His childhood outside of Toronto was not easy. His mother, Kathleen, suffered from severe depression as well as physical ailments like rheumatoid arthritis and colitis. The child of alcoholics, she became addicted to pain medication and in Carrie's eyes, emotionally abandoned her children. Carrie's father, Percy, was a gifted professional jazz musician who sold his saxophone to pay his wife's hospital bills. Carrie described his father as an insanely joyful, incredibly funny, animated character that didn't just tell a story, he became the characters. Everything I've done in my comedy career can be traced back to that origin. In 2014, Carrie reflected on how his father would have been a great comedian, but his own lack of belief made it impossible. Instead, he chose safety and stability by getting job, a job as an accountant. Then, when Carrie was 12, Percy was let go from that job and the family had to scramble to survive. I learned many great lessons from my father, Carrie said, not the least of which was that you can fail at what you don't want so you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. At first, these childhood adversities led Carrie to feel a personal vendetta, to blame the world for his family's financial and emotional woes. He became convinced that life was unfair and unforgiving. Beginning in third grade, Carrie started making faces in the mirror for hours, talking to himself in funny voices, and entertaining his family with impressions of neighbors and popular television stars. When his mother was in pain, he jumped up on the bed in his underwear and imitated a praying mantis until she was laughing so hard her belly hurt. Carrie had a huge vision for himself from the start. I've always believed in magic. He went on to describe how, before he was well known, he began a ritual of driving up Mulholland Drive every night, parking his car overlooking the city, stretching out his arms and telling himself, Everybody wants to work with me. I'm a really good actor. I have all kinds of great movie offers. As he repeated these phrases and visualized them coming true in his mind, he started to convince himself he did have a couple of movies lined up. And as he drove down the hill, he affirmed to himself, movie offers are out there for me. I just don't hear them yet. As he drove back down the hill, he was filled with a sense of well-being, possibility, and even joy, having lived through so many celebrations and successes in his imagination. Carey has acknowledged that these affirmations served as antidotes to the negative beliefs he picked up from his family background. Years before he became famous or well-known, Carey wrote himself a check for $10 million for acting services rendered and date dated it Thanksgiving 1995. He put the check in his wallet, where over time it became creased and worn. Every time he opened his wallet, the check reminded him of his intention and reinforced the narrative that he had embedded in his subconscious that he had already achieved everything he hoped for. In the next three years, Carrie appeared in Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber. Three films broke box office records worldwide and made Carrie one of the biggest movie stars on the planet. It was from his salary from these three movies that Carrie had manifested his intention. He had $10 million in the bank. Percy Carey died shortly after the release of The Mask. Carey placed the check he'd written for $10 million 10 years before in Percy's pocket and it was buried with him. I didn't know that part of the story. That was, that's really sad and beautiful. In order to understand how Carey's process worked, we need to examine in greater detail the system by which it is possible to install our intention in our subconsciousness from the concentrated power of the flow state to hypnosis to the placebo effect. As extraordinary as it may seem from afar, Carey's experience makes perfect sense when viewed through the lens of the networks in the brain we have been exploring. What did he do that uh, enabled him to manifest as well as he did, right? We want the brain to have to spend as little energy as possible to receive our desire when it comes. We want our desire to be like well-worn pair of slippers perfectly contoured to the shape of our feet. And so the brain slides in easily without any resistance. This is the phenomenon 
phenomenon of cognitive ease. The more the brain already knows our desire intimately down to the last detail, the less energy we'll have to spend to welcome it into our lives. And this is why uh, a lot of the manifestation books and ideas uh, center around things like vision boards or journaling, right? Putting the images of what you'd like to have, the kind of life that you see for yourself up somewhere where you're constantly looking at it, constantly bringing it back to awareness, back to consciousness, to enable our mind to attach to it easier than it would otherwise, right? Teaching our brain to know our desire consciously is not enough. We want our desire to be encoded in the information that the brain processes automatically. The brain must know our desire deep down below the surface in the subconscious so that it is able to seek it out and recognize it even when our conscious mind is focused elsewhere. And, uh, you know, a good example of this is like, right, there, you could be in a room where uh, it's very loud, lots of people are talking, uh, you can't really make out what anybody else is saying. But if somebody says your name, you're immediately going to hear it, right? You're immediately, your brain uh, comes out of wherever it's been, wherever it was, wherever it's been, and comes back to the present moment and looks for it, right? Because your name has been so intimately encoded into your subconscious that even if you're busy doing other stuff, when somebody somebody calls it, uh, you tune back in. And so what he's saying here is that we need to do the same thing with the things that we desire, with the life that we want to live, so that it's in the same way that even if we're paying attention to something else, when that thing presents itself, our brain will capture our attention back from wherever we were and bring it to the present moment and to that. It's not that the manifestation creates something out of nothing, it's that it attunes our attention to picking up subtle signs and situations in which we can further that dream. So see here, the trick in working with the subconscious is to teach it what is important to us by changing where our attention is placed and how we feel about the chosen object of our attention. This is how we bring our subconscious in alignment with the directives of our inner compass. If we are constantly distracted, thinking about our job activities, our to-do list, what others think, or the events of the day, then we can't focus on embedding our conscious intention so that it becomes the inner directive of our minds. We teach our subconscious what is important through repetition and positive emotion. As we repeat our rituals and visualizations, we enter a state of flow or complete absorption absorption in our inner activity. Deep experiences of positive emotion, whether from real or imagined experiences, teach our subconscious to associate the goals we wish to pursue with the biological reward systems of our bodies. In this state, our sense of self-consciousness is dialed down and we transcend the limiting beliefs of our mental habits and invite guidance from our deeper resources, such as our capacity for compassion or the creations of our imagination. Absorption in our inner vision is the state that connects us to creativity and clarifies our intention in our subconscious. The magic is that as we go about our daily lives, while we may not be directly thinking about our inner intention with our conscious mind, the subconscious goes on processing it and attuning toward it. We might think of, a, of the subconscious as comprised of filing clerk and a bloodhound. Once the filing clerk places a file in the cabinet, right, and that's our intention, what we want to achieve or accomplish or, or, or have, once the filing clerk places a file in the cabinet, the bloodhound gets the scent and relentlessly scans our environment for the slightest whiff of it. The bloodhound will then be on the trail at the subconscious level, attending to manifesting our intention around the clock, employing whatever powers, focus, or opportunities it can find. This is the experience of synchronicity, when seemingly unexpected connections begin to appear in service of a particular desire. This is a fundamental component of manifesting. What the subconscious seek, the, con the conscious mind finds. So if we feel threatened and believe on a conscious so on a subconscious level that we live in a threatening world that is out to harm us, our bloodhound will scan for threats and we will find ourselves discovering more and more threatening elements in our outer environment. If we have taught our subconscious mind to see connection, joy, fulfillment, 
and thriving, we will naturally find ourselves discovering more and more opportunities to experience those positive emotions in reality. The question is how do we get access to the file cabinet? The important thing to understand about the subconscious is that it responds to repetition. The more we focus on a particular outcome, visualize it, and imaginatively experience it with our five senses and repeat the desire to ourselves into the world, the more the filing clerk will catch on to the salience of our desire and the more our bloodhound will get to work to have our mind manifest our intention. And so repetition is key to this, right? Jim Carrey didn't go up one time to Mulholland Drive. He would do it night after night. I believe I've heard him say that this went on for months at a time before anything started even you know, re remotely coming up. And so repetition is a key. And so he summarizes here. He says, for Carrey, it was necessary to become conscious of the negative and self-limiting beliefs installed in his subconscious during his childhood that were obstacles to him manifesting his desires. And I think that's, that's such an, uh, a great line and so important. It was necessary to become, or it is for us, we're talking about us, it is necessary to become conscious of the negative and self-limiting beliefs installed in our subconscious during childhood that were obstacles to us manifesting our desires. What he's saying, in order to be able to manifest, you first have to do the work of excavating that, of understanding how you see the world, how you see other people, how you see yourself, right? Whether you believe you have the ability to change and to grow and to accomplish or not, and then working to change that if it's angled towards the negative. Once he was aware of them, he could intentionally offer his subconscious corrective beliefs, which he embedded by means of affirmation, visualization, and repetitive ritualized remainder, reminders sitting in his car up on Mulholland Drive. And so this is exactly, uh, this is kind of like the core right there, right? How do we do it? Affirmation, visualization, and repetitive ritualized reminders. We excavate all the false beliefs that we have from childhood, and then we focus our affirmations, visualizations, and repetitive ritualized reminders on the things that we do want. Through associating his intentions with strong positive emotions experienced in the present, he was redirecting his subconscious to pay attention to his desired outcomes and alerting his salience network, which he talks about earlier in a chapter, to scan for opportunities to realize his goals. Evidence confirming the cruelty, randomness, and injustice of the world became less relevant to his mind and made way for hopeful indications of success, synchronicities that advance his professional dreams, and perseverance in the face of the inevitable setbacks. Right, so this is another part. What do we have to watch out for? Anything that uh, points our mind towards the cruelty, randomness, and injustice of the world. Right, because what we think about, we bring about. So the more we focus on that, uh, the more we see of it. Right, not that we bring about as in we make it happen, but we bring about as in we start to notice more things like that. Our mind gets directed to where we put our intention. Kerry combined the sense of empowerment, gratitude, and joy he received from his visualizations and the neurotransmitters released by these experiences of strong positive emotions with the fierce work ethic ethic he demonstrated in refining his gifts at the comedy clubs. The secret kind of taught us, if you've read the book or watched the movie, uh, the reason it didn't really resonate as deeply for me because it felt like, right, if I just sit at home and dream of the new bike, if you remember the example from the movie, then I'm going to open the door the next morning or on Christmas morning or whatever, and there's going to be a new bike there, which uh, uh, kind of eliminates personal responsibility. All this stuff, all the intention and attention has to be combined with the work ethic. Otherwise, we're never going to achieve the things, right? We'll be sitting in our house, you know, trying to, to make a plant grow uh, without feeding it, without watering it, without giving it sunlight. The positive emotions he lived through in his mental rehearsal signaled to his brain that the experiences he desired were worthy of attention and that the mental resources should be devoted to pursuing them. In a sense, he was hypnotizing himself out of the grasp of his pine painful childhood experiences exercised over him and into the new reality of his future success. His ritual of looking out over Los Angeles and rehearsing his successes affected his brain the same way the medical ritual of visiting the hospital and being uh, given a pill affects a patient benefiting from the placebo effect. As a result, when success did indeed come, 
Carrie's conscious mind had already lived through it as an experiential reality through mental rehearsal and was primed to receive it without fear or resistance. And then finally, to summarize, as can be seen in Carrie's example, manifestation is not a one and done activity. It is a conscious practice diligently cultivated with care. Rarely do we get what we want right away. Instead, we must stick with it, often through thick and thin, even when our external circumstances and our own minds seem to be conspiring to keep us from achieving our goals. And there is almost always a moment where we must enlist the support of others to help us get there. And I love that he added that at the end. That's like, it almost feels like it, um, it doesn't fit there or uh, just kind of came out of nowhere. But the fact that we don't do any of this ourselves, yes, we're going to set our intention. Yes, we're going to do our visualizations, our manifestation, uh, all of that we're going to do on our own. But the actual execution of it is often going to be um, either dependent on, on other people or we'll need the emotional, mental, physical support of others so that we can fill ourselves with that, uh, that, that good ideal energy. So first, let's excavate these uh, lessons that we took on from our childhood, these false beliefs about our world. Let's excavate those. Then let's set our intention through repeated practice, through visualization, through uh, affirmations. And then when we're in need of it, to reach out to others, to find a community, to find a support that will allow us to remain in that energy as often and for as long as possible. If we can do that, uh, according to this neuroscientist, we'll put ourselves in a good position to manifest everything that we dreamed of. And so uh, if any of this resonated, I highly recommend this book. And if you're looking for that community to support you and help uh, engage you in this sort of thinking all the time, come check out the link in the bio, come join our community where we do this kind of work of self-healing personal development around the clock. Right? There's more information in the link in the bio, or you can go directly to the academyofselfhelp.com and come join us there.